And back with us today is John Rubino from dollarcollapse.com. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Elijah. Good to see you again. All right. Now, I'd first like to discuss gold because last week we hit a very key resistance point of 1360. You wrote an article about this, and now it's slightly below that. Um, it's around 1340 right now. What is your perspective on what this means for the gold market? Well, there, there were a couple of important technical issues with gold because it had a nice run from mid-December, give or take, to mid-January. Uh, when it added a couple of hundred dollars an ounce. Uh, but it got ahead of itself for a couple of reasons. One is that it blew, blew through the 50-day uh, moving average and kept on going. It spiked way above that. That is uh, another way of saying it got overbought. And historically, when anything does that, there is the chance of a correction. At the same time that was happening, it, um, it, it reached – the 1360 level, which has been resistance for the past five or so years, it's it's hit that level and, and maybe spiked just a little bit above it um, several times in the recent past. And every single time it's been whacked back down. Uh, so that represents pretty serious um, resistance, which it has to blow through in order to uh, to go on to the next higher resistance level. It, it didn't do that. History repeated this time around, where um, the fact that it got ahead of itself technically led to a correction. Now, as you said, it's down to 1340, give or take. Um, and that's to be expected, unfortunately. <laughs> you know, it would have been nice if it blew through all its resistance and kept on going this time. But and there was another, um, this time, fundamental issue with gold, and that was the commitment of traders report, which is a snapshot of what the uh, the paper traders are doing in the futures market in gold. And it had gotten very bearish, too, with uh, speculators getting really, really bullish. And they tend to be wrong at big turning points. So when they get extremely optimistic, usually they're going to be fleeced by some of the other players in that market. And that also happened this time. Uh, so it's possible from a, a you know technical standpoint that we have to wait a little while for gold and silver to to consolidate down here and for the speculators to decide that it's going down instead of up and start selling it short and and then we can be off to the races again. Now that assumes, however, that the environment stays pretty normal. In other words, it stays like it has been for the past few years which isn't a guarantee, you know, the, the fundamentals of gold and silver are outrageously bullish. Um, debt keeps soaring and the dollar is getting weaker lately and, and lots of other things are happening. Oh, China and uh, Russia are buying gold aggressively and India is buying silver and gold aggressively. Um, you put those things together and you get the, um, the kind of conditions in which something like gold and silver, which are basically small markets compared to the amount of paper that's out there, can really take off. So if it was just fundamentals, you know, and not short-term technicals that we were looking at, uh, you'd have to say you should be buying with both hands right now because the other big players who matter in this market, in the physical market at least, are um, also buying with both hands. You know, China and Russia are adding record amounts of gold to their stockpiles. And India is always a pretty aggressive buyer of precious metals. Um, eventually, those guys are going to win because um, they're, they're on the right side of financial history here because the rest of the world is borrowing insane amounts of money and creating conditions in which some kind of currency reset is the only way out of this. You know, we can, we can have a huge crisis in which the dollar collapses or in which the, the bond market collapses and we have a depression. Or we can do a currency reset in which we say, OK, you know, from now on, the dollar is worth one ten thousandth of an ounce of gold, which is to say gold is now worth ten thousand dollars an ounce. And uh, those two things are um, exchangeable for each other. So we'll go back to some kind of a gold standard and go forward that way with sound money. But the process of getting there means everybody who's saving fiat currencies loses a lot of value. And everybody who's holding precious metals, which are older forms of money and which are going to be the basis of the next monetary system, makes out. You know, if your gold goes from 1340 today to $10,000 an ounce, um, you, you had a, a really nice capital gain there. And it's the kind of thing that 
based on history again. You know, when, when they've done currency resets in the past, they do them by surprise because you can't announce that you're thinking about it and, and you're debating what price to do it at and stuff like that because everybody will front run you and, and the, um, the benefit of the currency reset won't be felt by governments, it'll be felt by individuals. Well, what they want to do is spring it by surprise. So some Sunday evening, they'll announce, okay, we're going back to the gold standard. Um, and, and so you won't have a chance to position yourself for that change. So the only solution now is to own a lot of the beneficiaries of that kind of currency reset, which is gold and silver, and as little as possible uh, of the fiat currencies, which will diminish in value dramatically when that happens. Right. And I know you mentioned <clears throat> the dollar and recently, you know, just last week, we saw new lows for the dollar we haven't seen in years. It, it was a three year low it hit. What is your perspective on what like what is your perspective on the uh, dollar index chart right now? Well, it's interesting because U.S. interest rates are going up which ought to be bullish for the dollar, right? Treasury bonds, 10-year treasuries yield a lot more than they did a couple of years ago, which should make them more attractive for the rest of the world. But that's not the way it's playing out. You know, the dollar has been falling dramatically. Um, you know, it's, it's not clear what's causing that because re remember when we talk about the dollar index, it's the dollar measured against other fiat currencies and they're all falling. So when one is relatively strong, the others are relatively weak in, a, in the context of all of them losing value at more or less the same rate. You know, it's just a little difference, which leads to the strong, weak dynamic in the, the currency markets. Uh, so the dollar is now falling against the euro and the yen and most of the other major currencies out there. Um, you know, I, I don't know how to, to explain that it's happening, except that it is happening. And that leads to some distortions in the U.S. market. You know, if, uh, if the dollar is going to fall, then that means imports get more expensive for us. So that's yet another piece of the inflationary puzzle that's coming together right now. Um, wages are starting to go up because the labor markets are tightening. Um, the price of a lot of raw materials have been going up lately in concert with the dollar falling, which is inflationary. So and, and financial asset prices, especially stocks, have been going way up. So those are all inflationary things. Let the dollar fall and import prices go up, which is also inflationary. And the Fed is going to be compelled to raise interest rates, which means that rates which have been going up will continue to go up until we get back to that dynamic we talked about to begin with, where there, you know, there's a point at which rising interest rates short circuit this recovery. At least that's how it's worked in the past. And we don't know what the rate is. You know, we don't, want the, don't know what the number is that breaks the back of the equities bull market, for instance. But as long as rates keep going up, we know we're getting closer to that number. And the falling dollar is part of that dynamic. Um, if the dollar keeps falling and interest rates keep going up and um, import prices keep going up, then at some point we're, we're going to have kind of a phase change in the psychology of the markets where people stop thinking that rates are going to stay low forever and start thinking they're going to rise forever. And that is terrifying for a lot of people in the financial markets. You know, we could have a, a huge bear market in bonds if this keeps happening, because remember, bond prices are just the reciprocal of interest rates. If interest rates go up, that's the same thing as saying bond prices are going down, which they have been lately. You know, bond funds are sitting on big losses now because of the increase in um, U.S. long term interest rates lately. Let that continue and the losses will just mount uh, until people in the bond markets finally get extremely negative. And when they start selling off bonds in a panicky way, I remember the bond market is bigger than the stock market globally. So that's a ton of money. That's trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars out there um, that could be flowing out of sovereign bonds and looking for a new home. That, that's going to be really disruptive for the bond market and maybe really beneficial for whatever markets that money flows into. You know, I kind of think it'll be precious metals to an extent because that's where people hide out in times of uh, turmoil. So a bond market um, crisis could 
set off a, a huge bull run for precious metals. We'll see. Uh, this this world isn't exactly analogous to previous cycles. So we, we can't know for sure that one thing that did something in the past will do the same thing in the future. But I kind of tend to think that um, financial laws can be bent but not broken. And eventually, the things that we're doing now will reap the same negative rewards that they've reaped in the past. You know, when, when uh, people borrow too much money, bad stuff happens. And it's usually the same bad things over and over again. And that, therefore, probably those bad things will happen sometime in our future. Um, but we've got a few differences this time, which are, are, are mainly the world's central banks armed with unlimited printing presses are willing to basically buy as many financial assets as they need to to um, stabilize their systems. So when the next crisis comes, they'll jump back in and, and we'll see what happens, whether they have the power to stop an implosion in the bond market, for instance, that's not clear. Uh, whether they can stop a resulting equities bear market, you know, re responding to or uh, because the bond markets are imploding, uh, maybe equities will also implode because of higher interest rates. Can the central banks of the world stop that? We, we don't know. We know they'll probably try when the time comes and they'll do things that are uh, even experimental by current standards. In other words, they'll they'll make the last batch of QE look kind of pedestrian by comparison. Um, because they'll not only be buying bonds, they'll buy equities, maybe real estate. Who knows? They'll, they'll be all they'll be buying all kinds of financial assets, and that's going to distort the market in ways that uh, the markets have never been distorted before. So we will see. You know, it's a fascinating thing that's coming up, and we're seeing the early stages of the catalysts forming now for the next phase of experimental monetary policy uh, from a you know, a, a policy wonk standpoint, this is fascinating. You know, this is amazing to watch. Uh, from an investor standpoint, it's terrifying because it's hard to know exactly what's going to happen um, when all of these moving parts really start moving. But I, I think that the safest bet right now um, remains precious metals and well-chosen real estate and maybe some energy assets, you know, real things that go up in value relative to fiat currencies when fiat currencies are devalued. Uh, but I tell you what, there are no guarantees, Elijah. This time around is going to be scary and fascinating and potentially extremely profitable, but not in ways that are crystal clear today. Right. And kind of expanding on how interest rates seem to just keep going up, you've talked about how this also means that the cost of debt is going up. That's just another way of saying, you know, if interest rates are going up, then the cost of debt, that's just another way of saying it, um, that the cost of debt is going to go up. And we're really not prepared for that. No. Um, it, you know, one of the chapter headings for uh, the Money Bubble, a book James Turk and I wrote way back in 2014, um, is the variable rate world. And that's about how um, so many different segments of society have taken on debt that um, that has a cost that varies with the level of interest rates. In other words, governments have borrowed tons of money at the very short end of the, the yield curve, which means they have to roll that debt over every year, every two or three years. And, and you know, we're talking five or ten trillion dollars a year around the world that has to be rolled over each year. Well, if interest rates go up, they have to roll that debt over at a higher cost, which means their budget gets blown up by their interest costs, which have you know heretofore been nice and low. Well, let their in interest costs double, and all of a sudden, a lot of governments are you know kind of functionally bankrupt. Uh, same thing with individuals. We've got uh, you know as we talked about the savings rate in the U.S. plunging, which is the same thing as saying consumers are borrowing a ton of new money. Well, a lot of that debt varies with the level of interest rates. So not only are we taking on new debt that has a cost at the current interest rate, but that interest rate is going to go up and the cost is going to go up. And to the extent that consumers are already tapped out, in other words, the, uh, the savings rate is at or near record low levels, they don't have a lot of new borrowing capacity already, you know, at today's interest rates. Well, let interest rates go up and let their interest costs go up further. 
And they're not going to be buying much new stuff that they don't need with money that they don't have. In fact, they'll be selling their toys. You know, I, I think RVs <laughs> or recreational vehicles are a classic short candidate in this kind of a market, um, as are boat makers and, uh, and um, the, the guys who make vacation homes. You know, the big toys are the things that get sold first when consumers run out of money. And the, the trend is towards consumers running out of money pretty soon because, you know, you can't keep borrowing against your credit cards to the point where you've got a negative savings rate. That can't last for very long. In other words, you're, you're spending more than you're making year after year. Uh, and we're not that far from that. You know, we're, we're heading towards a zero savings rate, which is to say uh, we're, we're actually going to be borrowing we're going to be spending everything we make and then borrowing more on top of that. And that's completely unsustainable. That blows up the system when that happens. Um, so the fact that we're heading that way at seemingly an accelerating rate. Oh, oh and, and corporations are also at record levels of debt. They've been borrowing money for the past five or so years to buy back their stock. <clears throat> so they, they've done well with that so far. They borrowed money at next to nothing. They've bought back their stock at prices that are lower than they are today. So they, they um, are feeling kind of smart right now. But when equity prices start to fall and interest rates continue to go up, um, the reverse will be true for corporations. You know, a lot of their debt will have to be rolled over. And to the extent that they're still borrowing um, to finance whatever it is they're doing, they'll, they'll have to do it at a higher and higher rate. And, and then their finances will look increasingly bad and their equity values because of that will look bad. You know, everything that has been going well for the past five or six years shifts into reverse when interest rates reach a certain point. And so again, the question is, what's that point? You know, are we there or is it another hundred basis points on the tenure? Uh, we don't know that now. We'll find out over the next couple of years and, uh, and, and then we'll wish we had guessed exactly right you know and pick the perfect time to start shorting stocks and bonds and snarping up gold and silver uh, and a few people are probably going to do that and they will become uh, the household names that the guys made famous by the big short became after 2008 2009 so some fortunes are going to be made by the guys who timed this right and uh, again we can't know ahead of time what that's going to be or who it's going to be but it's definitely going to happen now, you also have talked about the, you know, the fourth quarter GDP that was just announced and how it kind of shows that right now we're kind of in a debt binge, you've said. Well, yeah, GDP was a reasonable headline number. But under the surface, you see that it was only as high as it was because people are borrowing money, mostly against their credit cards, in order to buy stuff. And they've borrowed so much that the savings rate is now at uh, the lowest level it's been in the past decade. By the way, it hit the previous low, as you mentioned, in 2005. And that was a year or two before the system blew up. So if history is any kind of a guide, we're, we're creating the conditions in which we get another 2008, 2009 crisis at some point. Uh, it might be a different set of assets blowing up. You know, the, the housing market is, is pretty frothy in the U.S., but it's not the raging bubble that it was in 2005, 2006. However, stocks are, are by almost any valuation measure you want to use, much, much more highly valued now than they were in 2006, for instance. So that's one place where there's an air pocket. Mm -hmm. uh, cryptocurrencies are another. We've had this huge run in these new instruments that, um, that people are excited about in the same way they were excited about, you know, housing stocks and flipping houses and all things real estate um, in, in the last cycle. So they could be a catalyst. You know, if, if cryptocurrencies turn out to be a bust from here, that could be something that um, uh, affects the market. Bonds, of course, are in the biggest bull market in history. You know, the, the bond bull market that we have today started in the 1980s, <laughs> and it's been going um, um, for basically the lifetimes of most living Americans. Uh, you know, long-term rates were 15, 16% in 1980, 1981, and they've been dropping steadily for all of that time. 
And in that time, immense amounts of money have flowed into fixed income. Well, if this is the end of the bull market and interest rates are going to start going back up, um, then you have the real potential for a crisis in the bond market. Uh, and that's not even mentioning European bonds, where you've got Italy and Spain and Portugal and Greece still wildly indebted, completely unable to pay their bills. Um, and yet they're able to borrow at rates that are comparable to what the U.S. pays to borrow because the, um, the European Central Bank has been buying up all those bonds. Well, that can't go on forever either, uh, especially if interest rates are going to start to rise. You know, if, ra if rates rise here and that spooks the bond market, you will see the bond market absolutely panic in Italian bonds or Spanish bonds. You know, who would want to hold an Italian or Spanish bond in a period in which rates are going up? Um, and they already can't cover their current interest costs. You know, if their rates doubled, they're bankrupt. Well, they're kind of already bankrupt. <laughs> but uh, uh, take the ECB out of the equation, and those are failed states. You know, they are nationally bankrupt. Um, so that's the kind of thing that will, people start worrying about when the bond market turns, when interest rates start going up in a way that people perceive to be sustainable. And they start extrapolating that trend into the future. Uh, that hasn't really happened yet, but it, there's a good chance that it will happen if rates continue to rise over the next, let's say, six months. You know, if you see the 10 year Treasury, you'll do in the next six months what it did in the last six months, then you'll see panic in the bond market. And uh, and it won't be clear that central banks can stop that panic, at least in the short run. Uh, so things will get really interesting and really volatile. You know, as stable as the markets have been for the past year, they'll be that volatile going forward. Um, and that is just history repeating itself. That's nothing mystical, magical, or even really theoretical. That's just what happens <laughs> historically when people borrow too much money and, uh, and get themselves into the kind of trouble that we've gotten ourselves into today. Now, would you recommend shorting the bond market? Well, somebody's going to make a fortune doing that, but it's not clear when, you know, if you saw the movie, The Big Short or read the book, uh, you know that the guys who eventually made fortunes by shorting the housing market got creamed for a year or two before that because they were a little bit too early. And and then and, and most people shouldn't be shorting anything because it's, it's kind of um, slightly exotic from the standpoint of the average person who buys a mutual fund and, and sits with it for years. Uh, and shorting bonds has another element of, uh, of trickiness to it because you're responsible for the interest that the bonds pay. So there's a, a cash drain while you wait to be right. So no, most people shouldn't be shorting bonds. Only um, professionals should be doing that. But the professionals who do it right are going to make a fortune <laughs> if there's a bond market crisis the way that it appears there could be. Um, you, you'll see bond yield spike, bond prices plunge, and the guys who place a leverage bet on that event are going to make a ton of money. Um, and, uh, I, I do a lot of shorting of stocks, or at least I have in the past, and had a really nice formative experience with, uh, with my short positions doing really well in 2008-2009. But um, even I, who, you know, I, I think I understand shorting stocks. I'm nervous about shorting bonds. So it, it might be possible that it's better to look for the secondary effects of a bond bust by shorting the stocks that are most overvalued today on the, the assumption that they will go down dramatically if the bond market panics. But that's not a guarantee because it's possible that the money flowing out of the bond market will flow into blue chip equities. You know, that's uh, Martin Armstrong's take on this. And he's been right consistently when it, it didn't seem reasonable that he would be right about where equities were going over the past few years. And he sees another leg up when the bond market implodes and the terrified capital that's flowing out of bonds decides that blue chip equities are now the place to be. Um, so there, there's a risk with shorting stocks um, as a secondary effect of a, a bond market implosion. But I, I think it's possible that the, um, the, the only, or nothing is a sure thing, but the surest thing is precious metals because 
when people are terrified, one of the things they do is pick up a little gold and silver just in case, you know, and if, if 1% of the, uh, the capital in the world right now that is going to be terrified by a bond market implosion were, uh, were to flow into gold and silver, uh, you, you would see those things just take off because they're tiny markets compared to, for instance, the bond market. Uh, and silver even more so than gold. You know, gold is a pretty good sized market, though it's very small compared to bonds, but silver is minuscule compared to pretty much anything. <laughs> you know, there's just not that much silver out there. So if people decide that um, they want to cash out their Bitcoin or they want to sell some of their bonds because they're nervous about what's happening in those two markets and they end up with a lot of cash, it's reasonable to assume they'll buy some silver coins with that cash and that the physical demand for silver will jump, at least relative to the size of the silver market, and that pushes silver way up. So it would be easy to picture silver going up by huge chunks, you know, $10 in a day for five or six straight days to get back up to record levels, you know, $50, $60, $70 an ounce. That, that's completely um, feasible in the world that we've created. So I think that if you know if you're a regular person who doesn't do a lot of exotic investing and you, you've got some bonds you've got some stocks and you're nervous and you wonder what to do um, with the profits that you've got in those sectors that silver would be a reasonable thing to pick up a bit of you know sell a little bit of a bond fund sell a little bit of a, an equity etf uh, buy some silver coins have them delivered and store them in a very safe place and then you're covered in the worst case scenario. You know, if we have um, a Mad Max kind of thing for a while, which is a worst case scenario, which I'm not predicting, but it's within the realm of possibility and it becomes more possible as we take on more debt, uh, then you want to um, do a little bit of the survivalist thing. You know, you want to have some cash that you can use, both dollar cash and precious metals. And you want to take the other steps that um, survivalists tend to stay, take, you know. Um, Chris Martinson has a great course on, um, on how to prepare for a financial crisis. And the finance part of it is the smallest part of it. You know, he says, embed yourself in your community. You know, make yourself indispensable at work. Um, make as many friends as you can around you because you'll all need to support each other when the time comes. And having people who you can depend on is more important than really any other factor in hard, crazy times when the financial system is flaking out. Um, so silver coins are part of that process. You know, you want to be as self-sufficient as possible and having money that can't be inflated away by a panicked government is one part of that um, dynamic. So I would say that uh, the, the surest thing, though nothing is sure completely, but the surest thing going forward is probably silver coins. All right. Well, John Rubino from DollarCollapse.com, thank you so much for joining us today.